Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth edition of the RACI Queensland Polymer Group Seminar. Uh, this time we have a special seminar co-organized by us, the Polymer Group of the Queensland Division and the AIBN. It is with a great pleasure to have Professor Krzysztof Matiaszewski speaking today. And we also have a special guest, Professor Alan Rowan, to introduce Professor Matiaszewski. So just before we start, a bit of housekeeping rules. Please keep your questions to the end and write them either in the chat or the Q&A window. And again, I would like to acknowledge the RACI AIBN for giving us the opportunity to organize this series. And also especially Professor Matiaszewski to finding time in this uh, well, difficult times we find ourselves in. So now I give the word to Alan and Professor Matiaszewski. Thank you. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to have Professor Matiaszewski talking to us today. I mean, I'm old enough to have seen the evolution of the area he's worked in and the impact his science has done in this field. And it's phenomenal. I mean, originally from the Polish Academy of Sciences, his PhD, he then moved across to the Carnegie, Carnegie Middleton Mellon University in the United States, where he has become the world leader in a field he developed himself, ATRP. And it's not just that he developed that field, he's also pushed it to the point that it's applied across the world. And I, as a slightly younger scientist than Chris, but not a lot, have seen its impact through all the things, particularly in the polymer architectures, polymer materials. And very few of us have the opportunity to have such a global impact. Um, that impact, of course, has translated into many patents, working with many companies, and most prizes apart from one, but I think that's just a matter of time. Just to, crossing fingers for you there, Chris. I just think that's a matter of time. And I think that ultimately, you have driven the field and made this field, and we've all benefited from being able to use it to make it uniquely special polymers and polymer materials, and, and very few people have such an impact. So I let Chris do the science and the science talking, not me. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here. And I hope everybody has lots of questions at the end. Thank you, Chris, the floor is yours. All right, thank you very much, Alan, and thank you, Jan. Let me start sharing my screen. I'll just put my stop my video so I don't... All right, so uh, good morning to all people in Australia and uh, for me, it's uh, have a good evening because it's 7 p.m. now. And I would say that I feel very both honored and uh, happy to participate in this seminar. Uh, especially, I have uh, many friends and so good memories from my visits uh, to Australia and also interactions with many people, whether it is Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne, Adelaide and uh, many other places. So uh, what I would like to tell you today is that uh, something about ATRP, atom transfer radical polymerization, and some uh, more recent developments. So I'm just quoting here several papers published this year. So uh, giving you evidence that ATRP is not under currently. So uh, what I'm planning to tell you today is first to explain a little bit about some most recent mechanistic aspects of ATRP, how we can develop better, more efficient systems and how we can understand these reactions, how do they occur. Then I will tell you a little bit about the really changing and controlling polymeric architecture, uh, composition, shape, or topology, functionality, and even more complex architectures, giving you some examples of bioconjugates, but also some organic and organic hybrid materials and uh, eventually finishing with uh, batteries. Okay, let me... Looks like I'm stuck, probably. Okay, looks like it's moving now. So I don't need to explain to people in Australia how uh, important is uh, radical polymerization. Uh, nearly half of polymers are made by radical means because it's so easy to, to use it. You can do it in bulk and solution, in aqueous system with many uh, functionalities which can be tolerated uh, to growing radicals. 
However, the conventional radical process does not allow you to control polymeric architecture, no block copolymers, no star copolymers, and no more sophisticated structures. So for the last maybe 25 years or nearly 30 years now, there was a development of the controlled radical polymerization or as uh, IUPAC a committee chaired by Professor Graham Moore uh, suggests to call it the reversible deactivation radical polymerization. And indeed during the last 20 years, there was more than 40,000 papers published on the various aspects of the controlled radical polymerization of this RDRP, if you wish, and roughly speaking, half of that on ATRP alone. And if you would enter atom transfer radical polymerization, it would be more than 3 million entries. So it's a really quite uh, popular process right now. And I think uh, interest in industry may be explained partially at least by this uh, estimate made several years ago by Bob Matson at DuPont at that time, that it would be around $20 billion a year market for products made by CRP. And this can be around maybe 10% of the total market, but not by volume, but rather by market share. So more advanced technologies, uh, materials such as coating, adhesives, uh, sealants, cosmetics, nanocomposites, electronic materials or uh, biomaterials. And now in 21st century, we have to think, of course, about sustainability, recycling, renewable resources. Sorry, I got a message. Oh. Can you hear me? Everything is okay? Yes, everything is okay, at least on my side. All good. All right. So uh, when you think about really what is special about the controlled radical polymerization, uh, probably most people would say that we will use very low concentration of radicals and therefore they would not terminate efficiently. And this is a little bit misleading because there are many controlled radical polymerization processes which are pretty fast. They can be completed within maybe five minutes, sometimes even less. And for conventional process, typically it takes 10 hours. So of course, a rate of polymerization is directly proportional to concentration of radicals. So it is not the amount of radicals which matter, but rather how many chains are terminated. So in a conventional process, nearly all chains are dead, except this PPM of chains which are growing. And in a controlled process, maybe 1% of chains are dead, maybe 5%, but 95% of chains continue to grow. And the other extremely important parameter it's also life of propagating chain. These growing chains in a conventional process survive only one second. And for the synthetic purpose, we need now to have these control processes occurring during hours, or sometimes maybe even days. So in a conventional process, we have the addition of a monomer with a frequency approximately one millisecond each. And after 1,000 monomer additions, 1,000 milliseconds, so one second, there is a termination process. And in order to extend this one second to hours, we need to convert these active centers to dormant species in the presence of, for example, alkoxamine. This is what was done in, at CSIR in the 90s and uh, beginning of a nitroxide-mediated polymerization. You could think also about the metal, so it would be cobalt derivatives, or cobaltamine essentially, making the organometallic species, which are very labile, is bond breaks, regenerate radicals, which propagate once or twice and go back to a dormant state. You can do the same process in the presence of catalysts. So this is atom transfer radical process. And in fact, it's a very special catalytic system because you have uh, both activators and deactivators. This is a dual type of a catalytic system. Without activators, there would be no more radicals formed, no polymerization. Without deactivators, these radicals would propagate like in a conventional radical process, and after thousands of additions, there would be termination. So you need both activators and deactivators. And eventually, there is something which I would say it's a 
very special Australian specialty. It is a degenerate transfer process, most famous using so-called raft reactions. And in that case, one would use dithio compounds for mediating this polymerization. It is a degenerate process because you have a, exactly the same situation on the left and on the right side of this equation. So equilibrium constant is one. And here, equilibrium constant would be maybe 10 to minus five. Here, maybe 10 to minus eight. So what happens that the radical, after a few monomer additions, can take this atom, like iodine or dithio compound, and convert itself to a dormant state, unblocking this dormant species to an active form, which can propagate a couple of times and then exchange degeneratively. So in all of these systems, we care about how many times you propagate before you exchange, how many times you propagate before you deactivate. If there's only a few monomer additions, it's a very well controlled structures. If it is many of them, then you eventually end up in the conventional radical process. Another very important issue is that in all these controlled systems, we have quantitative initiation. In a conventional process, we have a steady state and rate of initiation equals to rate of termination because propagation must occur a thousand times before termination. Therefore, initiation is also a thousand times slower than propagation. In a controlled process, it's a different situation. Steady state or concentration of radicals is established by this activation deactivation process. And now you can decouple completely initiation from propagation. Propagation is still a thousand times faster than termination, but initiation can be even faster than propagation, which means all chains start growing at the same time. So this enables to make star polymers, so all arms would grow at the same time whether it would be star or brush, you can make block of polymers and many other fancy structures. So again, you take this one second life of propagating chain and divide it into thousand pieces, one millisecond each, and eventually insert between every millisecond, one minute dormancy in this chain. So this one second is still thousand milliseconds plus thousand minutes, so essentially, it is a day. So if you look at the scope of these controlled processes and ATRP in particular, we will get polymers with a very high uniformity or very low dispersity with predetermined molecular weights in a range of sometimes maybe dimers or trimers, so molar masses as low as hundreds, up to millions, sometimes even tens of millions. So in ATRP, we need monomers, which would be stabilizing radicals by typically resonance of power effects. And this would include acrylonitrile, it would include metacrylates or acrylates, acrylamides, but also styrenic derivatives. Typically, we work with organic solvents, sometimes in water, and the homogeneous or even dispersed media, like Professor Zetterlund is doing in uh, various range of temperatures, pressures, and even in the presence of oxygen. Typically, initiators will mimic growing chain ends. So for metacrylates, we use tertiary isobutyrates. For acrylates, secondary halopropionates. And primary alkyl halides would be even less active than tertiary and secondary. Typically, bromine is preferred. I will explain it a little bit later over chlorine or iodine and fluorine. And the radical stabilizing group, I mentioned nitrile would be better than benzylic or ester moiety. Concerning ligands, let me show you on the next slide that we establish a very powerful correlation of the ATRP equilibrium constant with electrochemical properties. This linear plot ranges over nine or nearly 10 orders of magnitude. So now we have catalysts which are billion times more active than catalysts which were developed 
uh, originally based on BP and, and some other complexes. So because of that, we can use now materials which will have a possibility of using copper at the very low concentrations. We can extend range of monomers, work under milder conditions, uh, not only with copper, but often we use also iron. We use uh, aqueous media, sub-ambient even temperature, tolerance to oxygen, and sometimes biocompatible system. So how does atom transfer radical polymerization occurs? We have copper one species, which is typically 3D10 configuration, and then copper two species deactivator 3D9. And then we must go for a certain transition state. So how these reactions can occur? You may have a direct inner sphere electron transfer process in which in a transition state, bromine will bridge carbon and copper and produce radicals and copper two species. Or you can have also outer sphere electron transfer process. And in that case, you will produce the radical anions, which can dissociate to radical and anion. There is also preferred, in fact, energetically, dissociative electron transfer process through a sticky so-called electron transfer. So this is concerted reaction. And finally, you may have also oxidative addition reaction occurring by a copper free species. Together with Professor Kluck from, from Canberra and Peng Liu, we calculated the transition state energies of these four different processes. So you could see here that this inner sphere electron transfer process has the lowest activation energy, and this is energetically preferred. And it is by approximately 15 kilocalories per mole more preferred than this concerted process. So this would correspond to a ratio of rate coefficients 10 to power 11. So this reaction will have a half lifetime one second. This one will have a 3,000 years. And if you go to this stepwise process, it has activation energy 30 kilocalories per mole larger. So if this takes one second, this will take approximately 14 billion years. So this is from a time of a Big Bang approximately. So this is obviously preferred structure, but what kind of a transition state we have? From this computation, you see that this transition state is bent, in fact, and this is also pretty late transition state, which means that this highest energy is for species which have highly developed charge and also highly developed spin on both carbon and on copper as well, which means it really resembles products very much. So this bent transition state is quite surprising because you could expect that maybe it should be straight one. And together with Professor Kut, we, we look how these reactions do occur. You could see that this alkyl halide comes from the angle and then in a transition state passes this halogen atom to copper and vice versa. And of course, on a computer, what you could do, you could straighten it up and you can have a constrained linear transition state and compare this energetics of this fictional structure with something which is energetically preferred with this bent angle around 140 degrees. And this is approximately, or uh, maybe 100 times three kilocalories per mole uh, preferred structure. So uh, what is really driving this reaction for this bent transition state? is mostly electrostatic attraction, as you could see here, and also dispersion forces. And uh, Pauli repulsion is a little bit disfavored, but altogether you favor this band transition state by, roughly speaking, two or three kilocalories per mole. So if you look at the catalytic system, and if you look at the uh, alkyl halides, they are really telling you more or less what's going in this reaction. So from the point of view of a catalyst, we have a three parameters. One would be electronic effect, which can be easily modeled by the homo energy of the activator, copper one species. 
very important hysteric effect because alkyl halide must come somehow to copper. And this can be defined by the so-called varied volume. And eventually very important is also ligand flexibility effect. So all of these three contribute very strongly. So for example, if you take bipyridyl, you will have a tetrahedral copper one configuration, and then it changes to copper two, which is trigonal bipyramidal, and it takes a lot of the entropic penalty to exchange from one to the other. But if you take tetrapodal species like TREN or TPMA, the copper going from copper one to copper two moves 0.1 angstrom inside the cavity of this ligand. So this is without any entropic penalties. So if you look at the alkyl halides, uh, the range of the activities uh, shown here would be approximately 100,000 times. But in fact, you may have sometimes even million or billion times different activity of alkyl halides. So typically, if you compare bromine with chlorine, it is uh, approximately maybe 100 times or 50 times difference. Although bond dissociation energy for copper bromine versus copper chlorine is approximately 10 kilocalories per mole lower. So we'd expect activity of alkyl halides being 1 million times higher, but in fact, it's only 30 times higher. So it is so because it's not only bond dissociation energy which matters, but also halogenophilicity. It is the affinity of these halogen atoms towards copper. And bond, carbon bromine is weaker, but also copper bromine is weaker. And in that case, they compensate. And instead of this million times difference, you get the, roughly speaking, 100 times or maybe 30 times difference. So the next slide shows you some calculated bond dissociation energies. And this is, again, work of Professor Kut and together with Professor Poli, who calculated what happens if you compare bond dissociation energy of various species. This would be a model of the acrylate. And we can compare also acrylonitrile, metacrylate, styrene, vinyl acetate here, and also ethylene. So it's easy to look at the relative values of these bond dissociation energy. So for acrylates, it is one, and for acrylonitrile, it is approximately 2,000. But in reality, rate of polymerization is a product of the equilibrium constant times rate constant of propagation. So now, if I would polymerize under certain catalytic conditions, methyl acrylate, within one hour, how long it will take for acrylonitrile or potentially styrene or vinyl acetate. Acrylonitrile will be completed within a second, styrene 10 hours, but vinyl acetate 15 years and ethylene 170,000 years. So obviously we need different catalysts. We need catalysts which are much more powerful. So this is, one reason why we start developing more and more active catalysts, because you can start polymerizing monomers like vinyl acetate or corresponding vinyl amides, which need these one million times more active catalysts. Also, if you want to go to the alkyl halides based on fluorine, you would need to have a catalyst which would be million times more active as well, or isocyanate or thiocyanate. Something which is also very important is decreasing amount of copper in this system. So you would like to have nearly all copper in a form of copper two in order to produce polymers with the lowest dispersity. And in that case, you can go to pretty low concentration of catalyst, five ppm, sometimes even sub one ppm. And finally, one reaction which was uh, discussed first time by Paul Bernard from uh, Brisbane, is formation of the organometallic species. Producing extremely active catalysts not only allow them to react with alkyl halides, but also directly with radicals. And radicals together with copper one can form organometallic paramagnetic copper two species. 
and this paramagnetic copper two species can react with radicals in so-called catalytic radical termination. So we need to have a lower and lower concentration of copper one. If equilibrium constant is higher, it is less copper one, less organometallic species, and less side reaction. Also, you may have a better temporal control. So temporal control is something very important in the ATRP, this most recently developed ATRP, which part per million copper. So indeed, having a very active catalyst, we can reduce amount of copper to maybe 20 ppm, sometimes 10 ppm or five even, but you can equilibrate this system efficiently with small amount of copper, but radical termination cannot be completely suppressed. So in that case, every act of termination will convert one molecule of this copper one activator to copper two. And if you use very low amount of copper, in that case, there would be reactions stopping down very quickly. So we need some kind of a regeneration of the activators by using mild reducing agent. So you can use chemical compounds like ascorbic acid, or you can use typical thermal radical initiators like AIBN, exactly like in raft process. You can use sometimes sulfides, you can use piece of copper or iron wire. You can use also electrical current. You can uh, use mechanical forces you can use also light under these conditions. And very importantly, if you stop regeneration, you can stop irradiating, or you can stop using sonication process, or you can stop feeding initiator ascorbic acid, reaction would stop. So you have a very good temporal control under these conditions, and with light, you have also spatial control as well. So one big issue is really tolerance to oxygen. This is something which was a big challenge for many years because oxygen is one of the most powerful inhibitors forming these stable peroxy radicals. In ATRP, it's even worse because with active catalysts, they can be oxidized very easily to copper two and the reaction would stop. Sometimes you can also take advantage of that. So for example, very recently was reported oxygen reduction reaction using copper TPMA under these conditions and formation of the hydrogen peroxide. There was a very beautiful paper uh, published or review paper, in fact, published by Cyril Boyer uh, two years ago on the oxygen tolerance in controlled radical processes. So on one side, there is some kind of a regeneration process in ATRP reactions, very successful raft process, photo raft or energy or electron transfer processes. And sometimes you can have also enzyme degassing reactions. So this is something which started by Professor Yusuf Yakchi for conventional radical process, but a very powerful work presented by Bob Trotman and Martina Stenzel several years ago, applied this process to enzymatic raft reactions. So using glucose oxidase and glucose, one can take oxygen and consume it, convert it to hydrogen peroxide, which is really not a very good radical initiator. So you can remove oxygen this way. <coughs> However, in ATRP, there is a problem because this hydrogen peroxide can react with copper one in a phenton-like reaction, produces hydroxy radicals, which initiate new chains. So if you want to make a degree of polymerization targeted, let's say 800, you get maybe 200, because you produce many new chains initiated by these hydroxy radicals. So polymerization works, but you cannot make a block of polymer. You cannot make a star because not only star will be formed, but individual arms as well, initiated by this hydroxy radical. So I'm thinking how we can really avoid these problems. And idea came from essentially Krebs respiration or cell respiration cycle, which uses pyruvate in order to scavenge this hydrogen peroxide. It's a very, very fast reaction. 
and it produces carbon dioxide, water, and acetate anions. So essentially you have like a breathing process because oxygen comes in and then glucose reacts with it, with the glucose oxidase and pyruvate, and you have a evolution of a CO2, and now polymerization is very well controlled. You could see that molar masses follow exactly these predicted targeted structures because you suppress formation of these hydroxy radicals. So it is a very powerful system, but at the same time, you have this glucose oxidase left in the reaction. And the question is, can I tolerate it or shall I remove it? Or how can I avoid formation of this uh, bio waste in a sense of a glucose oxidase, which is very inexpensive enzyme anyway. So we found that the pyruvate is also a very special reagent because it can exchange with a copper two species in water. These bromides or bromide anions are not very strongly bound and pyruvate can replace bromide from copper pyruvate, which is light sensitive. And then this bond breaks homolytically, reducing copper two to copper one, generating activators and also evolving CO2 and corresponding acetyl radicals. And you could see that these reactions can be run in a completely open to air atmosphere. There is some induction here because you need to remove the oxygen residual and then polymerization goes pretty fast. Let's say in half an hour, you get 95, 97% conversion with relatively low dispersities as shown here. So this works in water because the sodium pyruvate is very poorly soluble in organic solvents. If you want to go to organic solvent, then you need to use phase transfer catalyst. We add tetrabutyl ammonium bromide. And in that case, this pyruvate with the bulky organic cation is well soluble, for example, in DMSO and polymerization can be run in an efficient way. So, this is a little bit more complex system than I indicated before, because in reality, you have always copper one and oxygen, and this copper one can form peroxy species with copper and eventually hydrogen peroxide. Hydrogen peroxide with sodium pyruvate reacts in an original way, forming CO2 and acetate anions, but also pyruvate can exchange with the bromide here and form this photosensitive system. So now with light, we can essentially close the cycle and run these reactions. So again, you have two parameters which are very important. One is this exchange reaction. The bromidophilicity or association of a bromide anion to copper in water has equilibrium constant only 10 in contrast to organic solvents, which is a million. So therefore it's a very labile system with a pyruvate, you form copper pyruvate species, and then in the presence of light, you reduce copper two to copper one and form these acetyl radicals. In fact, they have a very high affinity towards this bromide and also reduce it to copper one, form the corresponding acyl bromides, which in the presence of water, they are not stable, they hydrolyze and polymerization is controlled, but there is small amount of a direct initiation as well. So to get a million molecular weight is not possible. We typically limit that to maybe 100, 200,000. And if you target too high molecular weight, there is still concurrent co-initiation process. So these reactions can be simplified a little bit further. And in fact, they can take advantage of the even oxygen in some sense. So oxygen can act as a fuel in these reactions. So typically under these conditions using GOX, we were using radical initiators such as V44 or you could use AIBN in an aqueous system in order to reduce copper two to copper one. However, another approach would be to use horse radish peroxidase in the presence of acetyl acetone. They react with hydrogen peroxide produced from oxygen glucose via glucose oxidase and produces 
ACAC radicals, which can now reduce copper two to copper one and start the reaction. So you don't need any more radical initiator. You need just these two enzymes and ACAC and glucose. So without oxygen, there is no reaction. You open it to air, it starts polymerizing. Then you close it, it stops and starts and slows down and starts and so on. So you can control these molecular weights pretty precisely getting polymers with low dispersities. This system can be further extended via two enzymes using another enzyme or uh, protein as an initiator. So in that case, we take BSA as a protein, we install via NHS chemistry corresponding bromoesters or bromoamide on the surface of the BSA, and now start using these two enzymes and make polymer conjugate system, which can be well characterized after digesting the protein you could get uh, individual arms with uh, low dispersity. And this system has been also extended to uh, DNA conjugate. In that case, it was the reaction which was done by uh, extending the DNA macro initiator with ATRP polymers. You could see very clean shift towards higher molecular weight. So these the protein polymer hybrids, they can be considered as really like armored enzymatic systems. They can prevent unfolding and refold, in fact, these proteins. They can work in organic solvents. This would be important for highly specific selective reactions. They can be also used for the protein therapy using some proteins which can be orally taken, not necessarily via IV using some conductive materials, uh, immunoisolating, and some others. I would like very briefly to tell you about recent work which we did with uh, exosomes. So exosomes are uh, extracellular vesicles, the smallest one of a size between 40 and maybe 100 nanometers. And they were uh, some time ago considered essentially as the cleaning of the cell uh, interior from by some garbage, but it contains a lot of the important uh, uh, molecules. It contains some uh, lipids, it contains some uh, proteins, it contains also uh, nucleic acids, microRNA and RNA, some big uh, shock proteins and uh, packaging materials and some others. They are existing practically everywhere in blood, in breast milk, in tears, in saliva. And uh, if you kiss somebody, uh, French kiss, in that case, you exchange exosomes. So uh, fortunately, they are not very stable. After more or less two or five minutes, they will decompose. But this cargo, which is taken from cell to the other cell, it serves like a communication between cells. Also, they can go through the blood brain, brain barrier. So, one problem with them is that they really outside, uh, they are stable maybe for only a few minutes and uh, polymers could help to stabilize them and use them in a more efficient way. So we do that by taking uh, some uh, very uh, lipophobic system like cholesterol conjugate with nucleic acid. By vortexing, you can install them on the surface of this protein, and then we can conjugate another complementary DNA strand with a polymer and make a conjugate by either grafting onto, as shown on the top, or we can also install a TRP initiator, as shown in the bottom, and then we can use, for example, photo ATRP under oxygen tolerant conditions and grow polymer chains. So this can be seen very easily by essentially increase in DLS of the size of these materials, whether you do it by uh, grafting onto or grafting from process. So in spite of having uh, polymer chains on the surface, they can be also internalized by cells and their stability is significantly larger. So if you look at four degrees, the uh, aggregation will happen with native exosomes. 
It doesn't happen with these polymeric hybrids. If you go to higher temperature, like 37 degrees, these ones will really shed some protein. And here they are stable. They're also stable against enzymes, for example, against trypsin. This happens with the native exosomes, and this happens with the uh, polymer protected uh, exosomes. And in fact, you can cleave also side chains, these polymeric side chains, if you incorporate the photocleavable spacer. So this is essentially uh, nitro uh, phenol derivatives, and after radiation, it returns to the original site. So you can remove them very easily. They are uh, much more stable. So if you look at the blood circulation half lifetime, this is a native exosomes. And this is what happens if you have a different polymer chains attached to the exosomes. It can be just pegylated structure. It can be sweeter ionic system. It can be also these DMSO derivatives, which recently was also used by uh, Andrew Whitaker for uh, different uh, materials. Quite inter interestingly, the biodistribution of these exosomes with polymers stays exactly the same as native exosomes, whether it is in lungs, lungs or liver or spleen or pancreas. So this does not change uh, if you do not modify additionally these polymer chains, which can be done by some uh, aptamers and some of the targeting devices. So let me finish now with a short story about the organic and inorganic hybrid materials. We grow polymer chains from either flat surfaces, from a spherical object, from cylindrical structures. We can control graft density with a high uniformity, making like photonic crystals essentially material, and materials containing maybe 80% of the nanoparticles, but still can be extended and can be uh, flexible materials. So first story is about the grafting from uh, flat surfaces. And we do that by a process which we call together with Eddie Benetti from ETH, uh, like nanoscale additive manufacturing. It's a very simple process. We can take a glass or silicon wafer and then we can install the via this APTS, uh, aminopropyl triethoxysilane, and then corresponding acid bromide, we can install ATRP initiators, and then start growing polymer chains in the presence of a copper zero plate on the top. It's at a distance approximately one millimeter, we use very inexpensive ligands, very inexpensive monomers. So the purpose was not only to make this manufacturing, but also understanding how these reactions do work. So you can measure not only how polymer film grows, but also what happens with a copper plate. Because by using quartz crystal microbalance, you can measure exactly how many monolayers of copper is departed from this top plate because six hertz correspond to one monolayer of copper atoms. In fact, the results are very interesting because if you look here, what happens to a polymer layer, for one hour, nothing happens. There is no polymerization. And then polymerization starts. But at the same time, if you look at this copper zero plate, during the first 10 minutes or five minutes, five monolayers of copper depart. So this would be, in fact, native oxide of the copper. And then nothing happens for additional half an hour. And then once polymerization starts, you have comproportionation and dissolution of this copper, now copper zero layer, and polymerization would go. So these 60 minutes is really the time needed for this copper catalyst to travel from the top to the bottom. And this follows perfectly this Einstein equation that using this diffusion coefficient to travel one hour, these copper molecules uh, would travel approximately half a millimeter distance. So this is very good confirmation how this works. And now, if you tilt the copper plate, here distance would be shorter, so they would start growing earlier. And then you can take it to another solution of monomer 
and have a second layer and third layer, and eventually you can have a very good control under these conditions. Now, another uh, simpler system, uh, previously this quartz crystal microbalance required inert atmosphere and so on, this is much simpler. So in that case, we put a drop of the monomer on a copper plate and cover it with a functionalized initiator surface. It can be top or bottom, whatever configuration you want. And this can be done now on a very large scale. So you could see these are wafers, which are 10 centimeters large. And if you cover it in a proper way, you could see that first centimeter and a half there would be no polymerization because oxygen freely diffuses and inhibits polymerization. But then, starting from these two centimeters, you have a very uniform layer of approximately 150 nanometers. The wafer can be so large that you can essentially dissolve this polymer, although with a very thin layer, and analyze it by uh, GPC. You can do that for different types of monomers. You can do that for different uh, supports. It can be cellulose or filter paper, if you wish. It can be also even elastomers. And you can go very uniform polymer layer, tilting it the way we discuss, and also using, for example, uh, these phosphorylcholine derivatives to uh, decrease the friction coefficients in inclusion, which is very significant. Now, here is a story about uh, grafting from liquid metal droplets. We all know uh, mercury as a liquid metal, but this is very toxic and, of course, impossible to be used. So, uh, we have some colleagues from the uh, robotics department that are interested in some soft uh, robotics using the liquid metals, highly conductive thermally and electrically, uh, and uh, liquids at the same time. Uh, however, uh, the one probably most valuable material is eutectic gallium imbium. So it's an e-gain, so-called, it has a melting temperature and crystallization around 15 degrees. So we disperse it in the presence of the ATRP initiator, which contains also carboxylic acid in order to be attached to the native gallium oxide on a surface and with bromoamide, and then we polymerize methyl metacrylate or butyl metacrylate, also block copolymers, uh, MMA, BA, and you can form very uniform structures. You could see here 100 nanometers droplets. They are so small that they are optically transparent, and if you work with the elastomeric materials, you can elongate them, extend them very significantly. However, one of the most intriguing system is really thermal properties. This is a melting and crystallization of the bulk again. And these nano droplets, they can go down to minus 80 degrees and now only crystallize. And then you heat them up and they melt around minus 25 degrees. So you very significantly extend temperature use of this again from plus 15 to minus 25, or sometimes even less, including the super cooling system. So the last part, which I will tell you, is related to the batteries. And uh, we expect that in 15, maybe 20 years, more than half of the old passenger vehicles it will be electric vehicles. So, of course, we would need to have a more efficient batteries, and we need to switch from lithium ion to something with a higher energy density, potentially lithium metal. So looking at the anode only, it will be tenfold increase in theoretical capacity and better performance, but there is a challenge. The challenge is that during the cycling process, there is a deposition of lithium and formation of dendrites. And these dendrites can eventually reach from anode cathode and there would be a short circuit and sometimes maybe even a problematic application. So we wanted to avoid this process and try to really prevent this both dendrite growth 
and also improve the safety of lithium metal batteries by looking at the anodes, but also interface, the electrolytes, and interface, and eventually with the cathode. So I will tell you today about the electrolytes and lithium metals. And the one approach in order to prevent the dendrite growth is to use solid electrolytes. So instead of a liquid electrolytes, flammable, you can use solid electrolytes. One example would be this yttrium stabilized zirconia, so-called YSZ. It contains the oxygen vacancies on the surface and it uh, really uh, prevents somehow the dendrite formation. But if you blend YSZ with a polymer, still these dendrites cannot be completely prevented. If you grow polymer chains from the surface of this YSZ, in that case, performance dramatically improves. So you could see here it's a pretty high current density, three milliampere per square centimeter. You could see what happens if you have a bare lithium. It makes this short circuit very quickly. This is a red one, it's a blend. And if you go to this hybrid material, you can go for 2,000 hours, so 3,000 cycles. So this would be like a, a three months uh, cycling process and still it stays in the same uh, condition. So uh, essentially in these lithium metal batteries, you typically have a solid electrode and liquid electrolyte. Now we go to the solid electrolyte and can we go to the liquid electrode? So if you have both solid electrolytes and solid electrode, you have a pitting process and these dendrites start growing. So we develop the liquid-like lithium metal anode by using uh, nano dispersion of the lithium particles and in the presence of the 5% of the carbon black, you could see that both they are fluid-like systems and they can be applied for the hundreds of hours uh, with a pretty good performance. So we collaborate uh, in this project together with the Ionic Materials Company and they are uh, developing various uh, solid uh, electrolytes and you could see here that you can puncture it without any problems, you can cut it in half and in fact, you can even restart the iPad or put them together and restart this iPad here as well. But eventually we would like to go to the larger grid scale uh, process with uh, these uh, liquid-like uh, anode materials. So uh, with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, people who did this work and tell you that uh, ATRP is not under quarantine, but we, uh, understanding and developing new catalytic systems and making various uh, hybrid materials with the biomolecules, also with uh, inorganic nanoparticles, flat surfaces, but the whole credit should go to people who did this work. This is a picture from a time when Eddie Benetti visited us for this additive manufacturing and the bio systems, they are done by Tonya and uh, Alan, as well as by Sushil, who graduated, in fact, today. The batteries work is Francesca uh, and Sipei, and uh, as well uh, uh, Yuan, and the uh, work with this spiker system, this uh, uh, photosensitive work is done by uh, Greg uh, Stepania. So this is the a little bit older picture. I show here the uh, picture from a uh, couple of weeks ago. And it's everybody probably in your place as well. We are mostly doing that via Zoom. We cannot uh, meet in a uh, daily basis. So uh, this is a current group, which I should also acknowledge uh, our contributions as well. Uh, so with that, I would like to thank you and uh, answer potentially any questions. Thank you, Chris. That was, of course, a great talk. It's, it's amazing all the disciplines that you can apply ATRP to, from basically materials for batteries all the way to 
extracellular vesicles. It's it's amazing, I would say. We also have Andrew Whitaker here. I think you two are very good friends. And I think he already has a question that he wants to ask. Should I stop sharing now or? Yes. Okay. Hello, Chris. Andrew here. Hope you can hear me. How are you? Yeah. I, I, once again, it's, it's, um, it's wonderful to hear you speak. It's every time that you, I hear one of your talks, there's something, something new that you, that you present. Chris, I just, I just wanted to start. I, 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 I love very much your QCM experiments and I, um, you, you started your talk really talking about the fundamentals, but what information can we get about the fundamentals of grafting processes from the QCMD experiments? Is it sufficiently sensitive to be able to measure, for example, uh, diffusion and of, of monomeric species into a grafted layer, um, measure the effect of different grafting density, for example? What well, we, I, I think this is uh, probably mission impossible, nearly, because uh, if you would diffuse a monomer from a certain level, uh, you will form such a small amount of polymer, it would be undetectable. So it's probably easier to do it the way we uh, look at this copper zero plate, because uh, you can see the catalyst, which in the presence of the ligand can either uh, dissolve or cannot. So if you have a, uh, after removal of these five monolayers of a native copper oxide, practically nothing happens. Without initiator and polymerization at the bottom, nothing will happen at all. So then these copper uh, complexes, which are formed on a top uh, layer, copper plate, must diffuse through the one millimeter distance. And it takes approximately one hour. And then they activate the initiators and then polymerization goes. So really what you can see is that the one hour time is needed for the small molecule to diffuse a distance approximately one millimeter with these diffusion coefficients, which is measured for this regulated metacrylate uh, aqueous solution of uh, 6, 10 to, I believe, uh, minus 11 square meter per second. Okay. Uh, that was a really very interesting part of your talk to me. Um, what applications do you have in mind for varying graph thickness and and also making block copolymers off of surfaces? Well, you know, I mean, one of the uh, interesting applications is obviously uh, lubrication. So uh, the uh, friction coefficients, if you graft polymers from a surface, they are becoming so small that you can essentially glide one surface on top of the other one. So this is a classical work which was done by uh, Jacob Klein uh, who said that uh, you can put a thousand kilogram load and with one finger you can really push it on the on the surface. So Eddie Benetti did a very similar work and even he made some loops on the surface. Uh, in that case the entanglement is even lower and lubrication even larger. So it's a question how you can do it in a simple and very robust way. How it was presented uh, in this work is that we can take practically any surface, you put a TRP initiator, you put a drop of polymer, and then you cover it with a copper plate or iron plate. We did also work with iron for biological applications. So <clears throat> unfortunately, the amount of copper is pretty high and uh, cells can die under these conditions. With iron, they, they don't. So you can use uh, iron plate and the Okay. Chris, there's a question from one of the, the attendees um, asking uh, about the oxygen tolerance system, stating that the control of dispersity is excellent, but what about the fidelity of the, the end groups of the chains? What can you say about that? I guess the control, the control tells you about the fidelity. Yeah. You know, I, I think that this is partially related. Of course, it's a question to uh, how high molecular weight you can go, right? So if you can go to a 
200,000, uh, 500,000 molar mass, it means that the fidelity of the anti-groups would be good enough at the beginning, but doesn't mean that you can go to a million. So at the end, you may uh, either lose uh, control one or, or the other way. So uh, I think that uh, we made block copolymers this way with using the spiker uh, in a similar way. And now we are using some uh, other uh, approach because UV, for example, for bioconjugate is not uh, applicable. So we need to go to the uh, blue light and we need some photosensitizing groups in order to accomplish these goals. Okay. There's, a, there's a few more questions, Chris, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. I know it's in the evening your time. No, um, uh, Natasha's asked, um, uh, again, about the, the experiments with the, the cover slips and the sandwich of your, your copper plate or your iron plate. Um, what, is, what are the uh, possibilities of confinement effects? So limit on the, the volume of reactant. Um, you're, you're precluding the oxygen diffusion, but um, what happens as you get, I guess, to higher conversions? Well, uh, you know, this is uh, not high conversion. Uh, so in that case, if you have a millimeter and you go one micron, which means your conversion would be 0.1%, uh, right? If you would have a very dense layer. So, uh, of course, you could think of uh, making this distance uh, closer or growing potentially longer chains, but uh, the highest we went, it was really some micron but we would not go to the millimeter because molar mass in that case would be in a billions or trillions, uh, probably uh, not uh, accessible. So high conversion, it could be in a very small distance, but then you need to have an extremely slow roughness between these plates, which is uh, another challenge. So I think, uh, you know, this is a simple uh, system which potentially can be extended to patterning because you can have a pattern, uh, for example, copper deposition or iron deposition in a certain layer, and then it would be reflected on the corresponding uh, substrate throughout as well. So it's a possibility, something what uh, Professor Boyer did with the photo uh, reactions, that you can have a pattern here would be pattern uh, induced by the pattern of the catalyst, if you would. Chris, we might finish with one last question, which is more on a philosophical bent. It's from Nazim. I mean, the, there are many early career researchers listening to your talk. And Nazim has uh, asked probably a fairly open-ended question. And what has made you such a successful researcher? What are the key elements for a successful career? What can you pass on to the young people listening? <laughs> <laughs> in in, uh, less, than, in less than yeah. 10 minutes or so. Probably there is no one answer to that. Uh, I think uh, first would be, you have to be lucky. But uh, I had a friend who said, uh, uh, harder I work, more lucky I am. Mm. Which I think is probably one related to the uh, other one as well. So uh, pure luck is not enough because without uh, uh, hard work uh, later, you can miss it and uh, the other people can do that. Uh, the other two parameters probably is, uh, you know, you have to be passionate uh, what you do and you must uh, like it. And I think that uh, most interesting things, they happen at the uh, interfaces, which means that uh, you need to try to, to bridge to other areas. So, for example, uh, all of us, you know, we were trained maybe as uh, polymer chemists and now we have to learn some elements of biology or electronic materials, mechanical properties and, and uh, coordination chemistry, photochemistry and some others. So, uh, one advice uh, would be such that uh, you have to be uh, very broad in order to really reach to different areas and understand and start using you know, jargon, which people are using. But at the same time, in whatever uh, field you work now, as a, for example, PhD or postdoc student, you must be best in the world. 
So this is what you do. You have to focus and you, you must be better than your advisor. You must be better than anybody else. But at the same time, you can pass your knowledge and your, your passion as well to the others and uh, don't afraid to, to talk because if you talk to somebody from a little bit different field, you can really multiply your uh, achievements. And uh, I believe that in many cases, what uh, you do at AIBN or other institutions, uh, it's the same story. You need to, to talk and uh, don't be afraid. I think it was the famous statement by Polish uh, Pope John Paul II. Don't be afraid, you know, just do it. That's great advice. Chris, it's great to hear from you again and see you again. And I hope we see you in person soon. I'm going to pass you back to Jan now, who's going to close the session. But from me, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for all the questions. And again, I would like to thank you. Professor Matyashevsky for giving this great talk and for taking the time. I think it's 7 or 8 p.m. where you are. So thank you very much. And thank you for pronouncing my name so properly. <laughs> yeah, I'm from Slovakia, so it's pretty easy. No, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, and I hope to see you right. in person right. in the future. Yeah. Goodbye. Things. Thank you.